Alright, welcome back everybody, and today we are going to be evaluating the improper integral over the real numbers of the reciprocal of the quadratic, and I've written the quadratic as p2 of x over here, just to kind of generalize it to all the quadratics, but as we'll see later on, there are certain restrictions we need on this quadratic. So yeah, let's just jump straight into the solution, you might have guessed it already, but we're going to be using some complex analysis today to evaluate this thing. So let's just get started. So first of all, I want to rewrite this integral a little bit. This is going to be the integral from minus infinity to infinity of 1 over, now p2 of x, that's just a quadratic, so we want a quadratic in the form ax squared plus bx plus c dx, and we actually want a, b, and c to be real numbers. There's probably other methods you could use um, if you want these to be complex numbers, but we're just going to assume these are real numbers for now. Okay, so we have our integral in this form right here, and well, what are the restrictions we need on our quadratic on the denominator right here? Well, if we have a quadratic, let's say, that looks something like this. Well, what's interesting about this quadratic? Well, it has two solutions right here, two zeros. And the problem with having solutions here is that when you take the reciprocal, so one over, let's say, zero right here, well, you're going to get asymptotes. So our function is going to blow up, kind of. So it's going to look something like this. And you can't really integrate that over the real numbers because our integral will diverge. So let's say our quadratic looks something like this, where it has no solutions or any real solutions. Well, then our curve will probably just look like some bell curve. And so we can actually integrate that. It's going to converge. And how about the case where this thing only has one solution, so it just touches the x-axis? Well, you're still going to get some kind of asymptote right here. Uh, let's see, this is going to give us a truncus like so. And this integral diverges if you integrate across the real numbers. So, essentially what we want is for our quadratic to have no solutions. And there's actually a certain restriction we want on our quadratic in order for that to happen. Namely, that we want our discriminant to be less than zero because the discriminant kind of tells us how many solutions we have. If our discriminant is less than zero, then we're going to have no solutions. If it's zero, we have one solution. And if it's positive, then we have two solutions. And this discriminant thing right here, that's equal to b squared minus 4ac. And you might have seen this from the quadratic formula, for instance. So the quadratic formula is minus b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac, all divided by 2a. And you see, if b squared minus 4ac, well, that's our discriminant, if that's less than 0, then this part right here, that's going to be some imaginary number, so we actually won't have real solutions. Um, and in the other cases, if discriminant is equal to 0 or greater than 0, then this square root will exist, um, hence we will have one or more solutions. So we want our discriminant to be less than zero so that we don't get real solutions so that our curve is nice and continuous everywhere and our integral actually converges. So this is the one restriction we want on our quadratic. So where can we go from here? So if you've watched my other complex analysis of videos, you will have actually already seen integrals in this form. We might have some other stuff like a sign on top or something. But this is just a generalization. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to define f of z to be equal to just this integrand right here. So 1 over az squared plus bz plus c. And what I want to do now is I want to calculate the poles of this function f of z right here. So where this thing blows up. Because if I know where the poles are, then we can use the residue theorem to calculate this integral. So the poles. Where exactly are the poles? It's where this denominator right here is equal to zero. Because if you have one divided by zero, then you're going to blow up to infinity. So where exactly is this thing equal to zero? Well, we know we won't have poles in the real axis because well, our discriminant is less than zero. So let's use the quadratic formula again. We want this thing to be equal to zero. So using the quadratic formula, z is equal to minus b plus or minus the square root b squared minus 4ac, all divided by 2a. And we can actually write this as minus b plus or minus the square root of the discriminant over 2a if we want, just to keep things a little bit shorter. But these are our two solutions. 
And remember, A, B, and C are real numbers, which means whatever solutions we get out of this quadratic, they must be in a conjugate pairs. So let's draw up a quick diagram right here. These two solutions, we know that they're some kind of complex number, but they occur in conjugate pairs. So if we have a solution here, for example, we're going to have another solution down here. And you can kind of see that because this thing right here, the square root of the discriminant is an imaginary number. So we have some real number which stays fixed and then plus or minus this imaginary part right here. So now we know where our poles are, we want to establish some kind of contour to integrate across. So how do we do this? Well, notice our original interval was from minus infinity to infinity. So let's just consider the finite case. Let's consider some kinds of interval from minus r to r. So let's consider an interval from minus r to r like so. So that's going to look like something like this on the real axis. So it just goes from minus r all the way up to r. And remember I said we want to use the residue theorem. That's why we figured out what these poles are. So we want to enclose one of these poles and we're just going to go for this upper arc right here. It actually doesn't matter whether you choose the top semicircle or the bottom semicircle to enclose these poles, everything's going to work out the same in the end anyway. So just that you're going to have a bit of a different orientation on the real axis. So we're just going to pick the upper half just so we can traverse this thing in the positive direction. So let's call this whole entire contour here. Let's call that C. And we'll call this arc thing right here, gamma. So our C, our contour C, is basically the interval from minus R to R. Then we're going to take the union with our gamma like so. And that's going to form our C. So with this information right here, we can write down a couple of integrals. We know that the contour integral evaluated over C of f of z dz, that can be decomposed into the into each of these separate integrals right here. So the integral from minus r to r. And now notice this is on the real axis. So in fact, we don't need to use our z, we can just use x, so f of x in dx, plus the integral over gamma of f of z dz, because we're back in the complex plane on this gamma right here. And so later we're going to be taking the limit as our r approaches infinity. So let's just put that in right here. So limit as r approaches infinity, limit as r approaches infinity. And why do we want to take the limit right here? Well, if you look on this integral right here, this integral, if we take the limit as our r approaches infinity, we're going to end up with the same bounds over here. So essentially, this integral right here is basically what we started off with our integral of the real numbers of 1 over p2 of x. And another nice thing is that if you take the limit as our r approaches infinity on the integral over gamma, it's actually going to vanish off to zero. And you would prove that using, let's say, the estimation lemma or Jordan's lemma, as I've proved in a previous video. So I'm not going to go over that in this one. If you want a full proof of Jordan's lemma, you can go ahead and check out the link up here somewhere or in the description. But for now, we can just say this integral goes to zero. So what exactly does that mean right here? It means that this integral right here, well, that's exactly the integral we started off with. So the integral over R of one over P2 of X dx is nothing other than the limit as our R approaches infinity of the contour integral over C of F of Z dz, because this part right here just vanishes off to zero. So now our question is, what exactly is the contour integral over C? Because if we can find this value right here, then we've basically solved our original um, question. So here, this is where we're going to be using the residue theorem. So the residue theorem tells us that the contour integral over C, that's exactly 2 pi i times the sum of the residues of our function f of z like so. And well, if you remember from our picture before, we had a semicircular contour, like so, and we had some pole right here, for example. So in fact, inside of this contour right here, we only have a one pole, which means we only have one residue to worry about. So this is equal to two pi i times the residue at z being equal to, let's call this pole right here z naught, so z naught, of our f of z, like so. And if we can calculate this, then we've basically solved our original question. So right here, what can we do? We can use the definition of the residue that's going to 
give us 2 pi i times the limit as z approaches this pole, so as z approaches z naught, of z minus the pole times f of z. But f of z is exactly this thing right here, so 1 over az squared plus bz plus c. And right here we run into a bit of an issue right here because if you plug z equals z naught into here, we're going to get a zero. And since z naught is a solution to this quadratic at the bottom right here, we're also going to get a zero at the bottom. So in fact here, we're going to get zero divided by zero if we plug in z naught. So how can we get around this? Well, we can just use L'Hopital's rule. So now our original integral is equal to, well, we'll still have this two pi i right here. And now we're going to have the limit as z approaches z naught, we're going to differentiate the top right here and we're going to differentiate the bottom. So differentiating the top right here, this is just some linear function in z and it has a leading coefficient of one right here. So derivative is just one and over and derivative of this bottom right here, well, that's just two a z plus b. There's some basic um, power rule stuff right there. And now we're safe to plug in z naught into this limit right here because nothing is going to blow up. So z naught, well th this was our solution actually, but notice we had two and we're just going to take this positive right here because it's on the upper half of the complex plane. So we're just going to take the positive for our z naught right here. So this integral is now 2 pi i times 1 over and now we have 2a and now our z naught is minus b plus the square root of the discriminant over 2a plus b like so. And notice 2a and 2a will cancel each other out, leaving us with 2 pi i times 1 over minus b plus square root of the discriminant plus b. Cancel, cancel. Plus b and minus b will cancel each other out, leaving us with 2 pi i over the square root of the discriminant. And that's basically our final result. That is the integral of the real numbers of 1 over p2 of x dx. And while well, you might be asking, well, we have an i right here, why is this thing imaginary? Well, remember our discriminant is less than zero. So in fact, we're going to get some imaginary number right here. And if you want, you can put a negative right here in the discriminant and you're going to end up with a two pi over the square root of minus discriminant because you're going to get an i right here, which will cancel out with this i up here. But yeah, I prefer this um, expression better. It just looks a bit cooler, in my opinion. So um, yeah, that's basically the final result. And um, I guess one more thing I want to talk about is um, whether you choose the upper half or the bottom half. So if you choose the bottom half of this contour right here, you're going to be going in this direction. And since Cauchy's residue theorem assumes that you're always going in the positive direction, so anti-clockwise around this loop, then what happens is that you're integrating in the opposite direction on this real axis right here. And also, if you choose this bottom contour right here, you're going to be taking this negative square root of the discriminant. And where does that come in? That comes in right here. So instead of positive, you're going to have negative and you're going to get a negative right here and you're going to basically end up with a minus right here. But this result is actually the integral from r to minus r. So if you want to flip the orientation, you have to multiply by a negative to go from minus r to r and you're going to get this result right here. So yeah, that is basically it for this video. I hope you guys enjoyed it and uh, yeah, up until next time, have a wonderful day and I'll see everyone later. Bye bye.